Hey everybody, welcome to the Single Tracks Podcast. My name is Jeff, and today Jero and Matt and I are going to be talking about the mental health benefits of mountain biking. So one quick note before we get started, none of us are psychiatric or medical professionals. Really, we're not any kind of professionals. Uh, so we are mostly going to be sharing sort of our personal experiences and observations and talking a little bit about some things we've read online and people we've talked to. But again, we're not professionals. So if you've got questions about stuff or you want to know more, find someone who is. So let's kick it off by asking sort of a overall question. What is mental wellness? What do you guys sort of think about when you hear that phrase? I guess when I think of mental wellness, I think of a manageable stress level, a healthy mental function. Yeah. I don't know. Being able to get through your day without feeling like your brain is clogged up. Yeah. Agreed. And I would add maybe, you know, feeling like there's some parts of life that go beyond the hierarchy of needs, you know, like, um, get some time to, uh, do things that I enjoy, maybe take care of myself, stretch, eat decently, things like that. Just make all the rest of life feel a little better. Yeah. I mean, to me, it's, it's kind of all encompassing and it, it's like a wide spectrum, you know, everything from just your mood day to day to, you know, at the other extreme end of the spectrum, illness or disability, you know, this is everything uh, from like depression and PTSD, learning disabilities, anxiety, uh, seasonal effectiveness disorder, uh, confidence, all that stuff. We're going to be kind of talking about how that fits into mountain biking and how I think we all agree that mountain biking can help with a lot of those things. So let's get concrete here and talk about some of the benefits for our mental health as they relate to mountain biking. Jero, one of the topics you've written a lot about seem to be a bit of an expert on, although again, you're not a professional. You're just a just a lay person. Yeah. So experiencing nature, uh, talk to us about that, what that does for people. Yeah, totally. I mean, a lot of the stuff that I've read and interviews that I've had with different folks kind of focus around nature giving us a, um, a different perspective and an appreciation for our surroundings and how we impact uh, the world around us and how the world around us has an impact on us. Also, a big component is the connection to this feeling of awe. So feeling like you are like, you're not the only person in the world and like your problems maybe aren't the only thing that's happening in the world that like this amazing tree in front of you or this waterfall or this trail that winds in some like particular way that's inspiring to you is, is meaningful and it's always there and it's really cool and kind of can distract you from your ego and kind of make your problems feel a little less problematic than they were before. Yeah. Some people, I mean, some people describe it as being like a spiritual type of thing. I mean, you hear people kind of jokingly talk about mountain biking as like dirt church, but I mean, I think a lot of people use it that way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I certainly do. Another piece is uh, just getting natural light, like being out in nature and getting some light on our skin and in our eyes is good for us in a variety of ways. And then also there's a whole bunch of science around gardening that kind of ties into getting dirty in general, um, where the bacteria and things that live in soil are good for our immune systems and good for us in all kinds of ways. And then lastly, just the social connection, like not sitting in front of a screen or, uh, you know, doing the, doing the things that we do in an office or what have you, but rather being out in a place where we might run into other humans and get a chance to talk with them about what's around us and what's going on. Yeah, definitely. Checking out from pings and emails and little red bubbles and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a huge benefit. And you've talked about, I think in some of your stories that you've written about, uh, forest bathing, that's kind of the buzzword topic and like the outdoor space, you know, people going outside and just, just like being in the woods. And that's really like therapeutic. For sure. Yeah. That's a, that's a really big component. Um, actually there's a great podcast episode called why a walk in the woods cures the blues on the outside podcast that kind of, they talk with a specialist that kind of digs directly into that nature bathing side of things. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. I like the piece about seeing it as uh, bigger than yourself. And yeah, like you mentioned, Joe, and you're out there and you 
ride to some waterfall or rock formation or something like that. And <clears throat> you just kind of check out for a minute and really, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I think it separates yourself from the real, real world a little bit to actually process, uh, what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You just get a chance to really appreciate something and whether it's a distraction or just a chance to take a break from everything that's going on in your busy life, it's a, uh, it can be nice either way. And as mountain bikers too, I think we have to be conscious of that sometimes and like slow down and maybe even stop, you know, if you're, if you're the kind of person who doesn't like to stop, like there is some benefit in doing that, stopping and like being in a spot for a little while and just like taking it all in. Yeah. We have an article about sit spots that kind of get to that, uh, that sort of point as well. Like trying to stop and really like observe one place and notice how it changes. And it's sort of a meditative practice to, to throw into the mix of your days when you have enough time to do that on a ride. Yeah. But that's not to say that charging hard on your bike can also have benefits. So Matt, let's talk about exercise. How does that help with, uh, obviously it helps with your physical body, physical functions, but it also helps with your mental wellness, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the research on just exercise and uh, mental health is nothing new. Uh, I mean, there's been a lot of research just saying that regular exercise and aerobic activity, even like a few times a week can prevent Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. But really what happens is it has a lot to do with the brain's chemistry and endorphins. So your brain can recognize exercise as a stressor uh, and in response release neurotransmitters that are basically going to fight a stressor. So um, overall, I mean, you can get a mental hit of stress-reducing hormones, norepinephrine, just by going out and exercising. That's really any type of exercise. But I guess here we're really recognizing the mental benefits of mountain biking as exercise. For me, it makes a huge difference on my mood. You know, if I'm feeling stressed out or angry even, I can go out for a ride and I'll be much more chill afterward. Yeah, definitely. You know, and studies gone, they, they've even found like studies of six weeks of just being on a bike, riding regularly can ease stress and anxiety. Another study found that, again, people who exercise regularly have much more activity in the amygdala. And the amygdala basically processes emotion. So by basically dealing with more stress, it has the effect to make you more stress resistant. I mean, so you're processing exercise as a stressor more regularly. And in turn, Basically, the studies found that people who exercise regularly are more stress resistant, um, aka more mentally resilient to stress. Hmm. Interesting. So, yeah, I mean, I know too, after I've gone for a big bike ride, I usually sleep great, and having good sleep helps, you know, my mental function the next day or the next few days. So, yeah, definitely experienced that myself. Yeah, definitely. I mean, again, like with exercise, you're getting this boost of, uh, I think Jero's going to talk about it a little bit more, but endorphins and neurotransmitters, uh, like serotonin, which is responsible for that runner's high that, uh, people talk about when they kind of feel euphoric and serotonin is basically linked to depression. So people with, uh, healthy amounts of serotonin have less depression usually. And then you get norepinephrine, which is like a stress fighting chemical, which reduces cortisol, which is this stress causing chemical. So yeah, all around it's, it's a pretty good brain cocktail just to get out and get blood flowing on the bike. Yeah. Very cool. So yeah, Matt mentioned endorphin release. Jero, what's, what's that all about? Is this like tied to, you know, like an adrenaline rush that we get from mountain biking? Does that actually do something for us mentally? It seems similar. Again, I'm, I'm no expert, but, uh, from what I've read, uh, it's endorphins are a naturally produced chemical that, yeah, that give us, like Matt said, that runner's high. They're also a natural painkiller, so they kind of allow us to push through, you know, big challenges and get stronger and get better at things and deal with challenges and deal with the pain and have like a positive experience with that pain. Yeah, and it's something that comes up in our forums every year from what I've seen. This question of folks suffering from seasonal affect disorder and the lack of natural light, lack of fresh air, and lack of exercise, like they're missing their endorphins, they don't maybe want to go sweat in the gym with everybody else. And so it's certainly something that a lot of folks have brought up in terms of, you know, when it's missing, they really know. Yeah, it's interesting. You, you mentioned how it's sort of linked to our ability to feel pain 
uh, or to sort of dull pain. And this came up when we were talking uh, with Bonnie from Backcountry Lifeline about how mountain bikers, they'll be riding along really hard and, and getting a crash and immediately will jump up and be like, oh, I'm fine. I feel fine. <laughs> and really like it's, you know, yeah. But everybody watching is like, ooh, that, that had to have hurt. But yeah, we don't. Yeah, you broke something. <laughs> we don't realize it because those endorphins, I guess, are flowing pretty hard uh, when we're on the bike. Yeah, that endorphin is basically just a combined term for endogenous morphine. So it's like a uh-huh. basically a morphine that your own body produces and attaches to the same opioid receptors that actually deal with pain. Huh. So yeah, it's actually like a legit, <laughs> a legit pain killing mechanism. Yeah. So one of the things that I've found with mountain biking too is that like goal setting and sort of the competitive nature of the sport can really help me um, and others too, I'm sure. So, you know, whenever you set a goal like to complete a big mountain bike race or just to improve your fitness or your skills, you know, that really promotes a positive mindset, gives you something to look forward to. For those who are like procrastinators or, you know, feel like they have a hard time getting things done, you know, setting a goal can really help to motivate you and like get you out there doing the things that you should do, the things that are good for you. Also for those who might be dealing with, you know, more serious issues, mood disorders or depression, they could use that to like have something to look forward to, like something to like a goal again to, to, and then also it gives the mind something positive to focus on. You know, you might be going through something tough in your life emotionally or, or just stress from work or things like that. And again, having a goal can give you something positive to look forward to, though it can be taken too far. You know, for some, it could be sort of escapism. You probably know some people who just bike way too much, you know, like on one level, you're kind of jealous of them. But on another, you're like, I think they might have a problem. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. How do you get anything else done? Right. Right. And so, yeah, I mean, that's not always a good thing. So definitely like, I don't know look to yourself and be like, am I, am I using it to escape something or am I really using it in a positive way? And then also races themselves are really designed to build confidence in a lot of ways. You know, crossing the finish line is something we can all take pride in. You know, you, you start a race and the goal is, is to finish the race. And when you do that, it definitely can build confidence. And especially these days, most races have just a ton of like age and gender and equipment divisions which gives everybody a really good chance to get on the podium, which again can, can boost your confidence and your mood. And then learning those skills as well, like learning a new mountain bike skill will give you more confidence. You know, you've mastered something that's difficult, maybe a little bit of swagger, you know, I mean, if you like make your fitness goal, you're probably going to be strutting around, like feeling a lot better about yourself. I think a lot of us use it that way. And then on the flip side, of course, we can all learn some humility as well from mountain bike goal setting or or racing, you know, especially if you're somebody who has like a really outsized ego and you're like, I'm, I'm the best mountain biker around here. And then you sign up for your first race and then you realize you're not the fastest person out there, at least not yet. So it can be a good way to like keep your ego in check, especially because the, you know, the clock clock is pretty objective, like, you, you know. I like, I've got young kids and, you know, we play a lot of board games and the idea is that like that teaches them to follow rules and like not cheat and mountain biking is kind of the same way. I mean, I guess you can cheat, but, but the clock doesn't lie in general. Right. So that's a really objective measure you can use to give yourself confidence and to understand like where you're at in terms of your fitness. And then finally, I wanted to talk about Nika a little bit too, you know, Nika is using mountain biking to teach really to teach life lessons to, to young people in the U S anyway. Um, a lot of people see it. I mean, the industry loves it because it's getting younger people into the sport, but you know, at its core, Nika is really just about, about these life lessons. And, um, that goes a, a really long way toward building like mental wellness for years to come and people who participate. So, if you're not familiar, you know, the focus of NICA really isn't so much on competition as it is teamwork and camaraderie and sort of setting personal goals. And again, these are all like really good life skills that can help anyone, but especially when you're young and impressionable to sort of get that 
it's just going to lead to like a lifetime of mental wellness. Yeah. And teaching resiliency again, like that's a huge thing with Nike is like, if you can teach youth how to be resilient and overcome adversity, uh, through mountain biking, like nobody's on the bench, everybody's participating. Uh, everybody gets a dose of challenge basically. I mean, I think we've all been out with somebody who's mountain biking for the first time and you learn like how well that person deals with a challenge and like, they're like, Nope, this is not for me. I'm never trying it again. Or, you know, they're going to keep, uh, keep trying, even though it it might be kind of hard, but yeah, I mean, resiliency is an important, important life skill to have. Yeah. That seems to be a really big buzzword, you know, grit, like with, with, uh, education these days, teaching kids grit and, you know, the older generation always thinks the younger generation is too soft and they don't know how to deal with problems. And, you know, maybe that's true. Maybe it's not, but mountain biking definitely is a good way to teach that. Cause yeah, you're going to run into problems all the time. You're going to have a flat tire. What do you do? Or you're going to have a crash. How do you recover from that? Do you jump back up or, or you just lay there on the ground and, and, you know, quit the race. So hope somebody comes for you. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. I remember thinking when I first really got into mountain biking and, you know, had the humility to say, I'm not great at this and I want to get a lot better. I remember thinking like, this is like snowboarding where the first, the beginning of it is pretty painful and not super rewarding. (laughs) And like, you have to really want to do it and probably have some examples in your life of people who do it, who you think are cool or something to to make you want to do it. Cause it's like, it's hard, it's expensive and it takes a little while to get the payback. Um, so yeah, that, that, re- that resiliency is yeah, for sure. Uh, it's immediate. Yeah, that's great. Well, yeah. Speaking of like looking to others to sort of want to get into the sport, Matt, a big part of mountain biking for a lot of people is socializing, which I think there's countless studies showing that that has benefits for mental wellness. What, what have you found in terms of the benefits to mountain biking as it relates to socializing with others? It's pretty huge, like more than I really would have thought. Uh, and it was funny. I was, I had like a few minutes last week to like sit down and read a non bike related article. And, uh, that was pretty cool, but it was a, and a, an essay and opinion piece on the New York times by Richard Friedman. He's a psychiatrist. And basically he's talking about like, you can basically replace the word swimming with mountain biking in here. And it's like a hundred percent relatable, but it was, the title was uh, what swimming taught me. He's in his fifties now and he's at a recreation pool. He used to be a swimmer, hadn't swam in a while. You know, he's out there just swimming, super rusty and this other swimmer sort of recognizes that he has like some resemblance to proper swimming form and he's actually a pretty <laughs> decent swimmer. And so he invites him to join their swim club. And so he does, you know, and he goes and joins the club, these people that swim regularly and much like a group of mountain bikers, the group of swimmers is focused on being faster. Like that's what they, that's the goal they want to achieve is just getting faster. And this coach, uh, you know, is just insistent on, well, you can't get faster unless you master the form first. Like speed of swimming comes with form just like mountain biking does. Like you have to have proper form if you really want to ride fast consistently. And so kind of his connection is people are trying too hard to be fast without mastering the form first. And then he connects that to people are now too busy trying to be happy. Like they're out there going to yoga, downloading apps for mindfulness, downloading meditation apps. Like they're going out of their way for all these methods to find happiness now. When really what the overall theme of it was, is he suggests another article by journalist Ruth Whitman, who kind of pairs her book with some research and says that the number one predictor in a happy life, like basically people with the happiest lives, you know, if they're rating their life in terms of happiness, the strongest predictor is that they have strong social relationships. So basically having good friendships, having good relationships with your family is the largest indicator in happiness. So, I mean, yeah, having good riding buddies, like people that you're constantly out there 
trying to, you know, text, Hey, what time are you off work today? Do you want to meet at the trailhead at six? Like, and then following through with those can be one of the strongest predictors in just your overall happiness level. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. I mean, I've definitely found that myself having a good group of folks to ride with regularly. I look forward to that ride the most of anything during the week. Yeah. And there's, you know, again, like anything with psychology and mental wellness kind of comes down to like the three tenets of psychology and that's your psychological makeup, your brain chemistry, and then your environmental stimuli. And so of course, like friendships and relationships, the wellness is definitely based on brain chemistry and what's happening. And to where before dopamine was really thought largely, uh, I mean, it's like the reward neurotransmitter. So you get it if you're eating chocolate or having sex or doing drugs or, you know, winning on the jackpot, <laughs> gambling or something like that. But a lot of new research is saying that dopamine even happens with social relationships. So when you are planning that ride, you might even be building a little bit of dopamine and then towards, you know, in the process of meeting with that person and completing a ride, like out there giving social feedback on the trail, like, Hey, good job nailing that drop or finishing the climb. It sounds like there actually is some dopamine associated with that, like some sort of reward process in your brain chemistry. All right. So we talked about some of the benefits, you know, how we get these mental wellness benefits from mountain biking. Let's talk a little bit about some groups out there that are using mountain biking to improve mental health. And I want to talk about these just to give examples of how people are putting this stuff into practice and to show that, you know, this isn't just us thinking this in our minds that like, oh, this is helpful for us. So it must be helpful to other people. Some of these are pretty big groups that are, are again, using mountain biking in that way. So Matt, one of the big ones that we've heard a little bit about over the years is the Specialized Foundation, and they've done some studies and also put some funding behind using mountain biking to help kids with certain kinds of learning disabilities, right? Yeah, this one is actually news to me. So it's a Specialized Outride Foundation, uh, Outride meaning Outride ADHD. And so Mike Sinyard, the CEO of Specialized, basically has a history of ADHD and had always felt like it interfered with his learning and his mental health when he was a kid. And over the course of just riding bikes, he always felt that he had a, a better time concentrating, a better time completing tasks, following through with things after spending time on the bike. And then it, this is kind of just off of their material, according to the Outrate, or Outride Foundation's material. An article came across his desk about how writing is a form of Ritalin. And so, I mean, I mean, I think everybody kind of knows that Ritalin is often overprescribed and, you know, might not even be all that effective in treating ADHD. So Specialized's goal is basically to partner with research institutions and actually go forward with legit studies to, sh to see how effective cycling is in dealing with ADHD. And so their preliminary studies basically showed that even for a month, if kids are riding four or five days a week, in the end, they're, they're happier, they have better cognitive performance, they're better at their social relationships, they have better mood regulation. Uh, and even after one ride, they're found to be less impulsive. So the long-term goal is basically that they can formulate this research, make it legit, and then basically propose it to I don't know, medical fields is, you know, something that maybe doctors will end up prescribing. Hey, you have to go ride your bike, you know, four or five days a week. And, uh, yeah, that can hopefully end up, uh, helping people deal with ADHD. Yeah. I know there are a few programs around the country that are latching onto that and using it in their, I just saw one today in my Facebook that showed up called camp Southern ground here in Georgia. And, Somehow Zach Brown from Zach Brown band was like part of the fundraising for this. They're trying to raise money to build like a pump track and stuff. But, um, but they mentioned using the specialized foundations writing for focus curriculum uh, to help kids with ADHD. And then we've also worked with, talked with some people from the King school in, I believe it's in upstate New York where they have a summer program that uses mountain biking to help kids build academic skills for kids with ADHD, but also other learning challenges. 
And we interviewed the coach, uh, David Mendelewski, who got the idea after hearing about a father's 14-year-old son with ADHD who found improvement just from mountain biking. And so, again, it's kind of interesting that a lot of people kind of independently came to the same conclusion that it helps, you know, and in this case, it was, it was this kid and this dad saw that his 14 year old kid was helped by it. And then they went on the internet and lo and behold, you know, this specialized foundation study comes up. And so it does seem like there's definitely some merit to it, whether there's scientific sort of understanding of it yet or not, uh, it does seem to be pretty effective. Yeah, so Jero, you've been looking at you. You've done a whole series of articles, um, and I'm sure you have more to come about mountain biking and mental health, called Three Deep Breaths. And uh, one of the interviews that you did was with a guy who's doing a Scottish Health Mental Study, a study in Scotland where they're looking at how mountain biking can help. How how does that work? What have they found so far? Yeah, so it's a group of researchers from a local university and then a couple of mountain bike guides that they paired up with. And what they do is they get patients from a local outpatient service um, who choose to be a part of this. So they kind of, they sell the idea and the patients let them know. And they're essentially, the, theoretically what they're doing ties into everything we've all kind of already talked about. They're using mountain bikes to pre- present social and physical challenges that people can overcome and to let folks set goals and to see that those goals can be achieved. And also that if they can't, it's okay. You can sort of reassess and set new goals. It helps a lot of people with different social skills that they're, they're feeling challenged with. And then also the element that mountain biking is meditative, that it requires so much focus that you can't really be thinking about the other things that would be occupying your brain and maybe stressing you out. And their hope is to create really a model of this program. It's a six-week program where folks come out and ride once a week. And I mean, before it, there's a bunch of lead up of creating these goals and talking about what mountain biking is like and where they're going to go and what to do if some, you know, some, they crash or they get lost or whatever. So it's really, uh, kind of well guided as well, but they want to create a model that they can extend to the rest of the UK. And obviously if that works well, anyone else can adopt it and, and create something in their own community. So I'm not sure if they've started the second pilot yet, but the first one was really successful and they're working on analyzing the data and the folks at the university are of course going to publish all their findings. Very cool. Sort of reminds me, I guess in the nineties, uh, it seems like ropes courses were like all the rage, you know, that was, that was <laughs> totally. like the thing you'd like, yeah, take people on to, to build a lot of those same skills and that resilience and stuff. And, um, yeah, it's cool to see that mountain biking is sort of taking over that role and, and maybe there are some differences. I mean, that would be really interesting to see if, if it's more or less effective just cause, cause it is different. I mean, a ropes course, you're not necessarily getting exercise. So we're kind of combining exercise and technical mastery and socialization. I mean, it, it rolls all of that into one big thing. And so it seems like there are potentially more benefits to mountain biking. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's also some similarities to programs like Outward Bound and various programs that have like taken uh, kids from the city to go experience the forest and often kids that were struggling with a lot of behavioral challenges, you know, and doing things like not letting them talk for a week in the woods while they go camping for the first time ever. And, (laughs) you know, there's there's different theories about whether how that worked and whether it should continue. But it's it's doing a similar thing in some ways of just creating these challenges and letting people kind of feel the challenge and feel it out and experience it. Cool. Um, one of the programs that I've seen that, that seems really interesting in, as far as supporting mental wellness is the Semperfy Foundation or organization. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but it's a group that supports disabled veterans and their family members. And, you know, a lot of these these folks who are being supported have physical injuries, but a lot of them also suffer from things like PTSD, uh, you know, related to their service or their injury or whatever. And 
I know we've seen WTB, the tire brand, uh, has supported this group in the past and have made it possible for a lot of the bikers or a lot of these, sorry, veterans ride bikes again. You know, some of them have uh, amputations or things like that that need to be adapted to ride bikes. But but companies like WTB and groups like Simplify, they they really believe in the transformative power of biking in the woods. And we were up, I guess it was a couple of years ago, staying at Pilot Cove in uh, Pisgah out there for a biking trip. And there was a group of veterans there staying at the property at the same time as us. And they were on kind of a similar program. They weren't using bikes, but they were there to like do rock climbing and like, you know, do some waterfall hikes and stuff like that as a part of their sort of recovery and transition back into, into society really after, you know, being on the battlefield for a long time. So again, another really cool use of mountain biking and and healing these mental wounds and, and helping support mental wellness. Yeah. That's really cool that, that folks are working to, to find ways to work with that kind of trauma. I mean, that's, that's impressive. I can't imagine there's a lot of folks, uh, there's a lot of veterans who, are like really having some amazing moments in those situations. It'd be, it'd be cool to interview some of them sometime. If anybody's, you know, if we could find, uh, some vets who wanted to talk about that experience. Yeah, definitely. There does seem to be a connection between sort of military service and mountain biking. And I don't know. I mean, it could be cause it's a, it's a macho tough thing to do and you, you can challenge yourself physically. But, um, I think, I think it really does help with a lot of the stress. You know, Matt and I are both veterans and can't speak for you, Matt, but, um, but I definitely use mountain biking to sort of, you know, relieve a lot of that stress uh, while I was on active duty. Yeah, definitely found it at the right time, like after discharging. And for me, it helped deal with a lot of my ego. <laughs> it's like I got out of the Marines and the Marines are really good at building up your ego. And then you go back into society and you kind of have to temper that a little bit. So yeah, I mean, honestly, for me, it was really good at uh, humbling myself again. So, yeah, rocks don't care that you're a marine. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like you're tough. Nope. You're tougher. <clears throat> right. <laughs> cool. Uh, another group I know that Jerome you've looked at is called the Sacred Cycle, and that's uh, doing. They're doing interesting work in Carbondale, Colorado. Talk a little bit about that group, how they're using mountain biking. Yeah, it's an organization run by a woman named Heather Russell in Carbondale, and they work, as far as I know, solely with uh, survivors of sexual assault, helping them work through trauma, and again, working with like finding different challenges, refocusing, working on being present. So they're really like, they're looking at using the bike to see some different challenges that can happen out in nature and work through those and then use those as an example for um, the different challenges that folks are dealing with around sexual trauma. One of the interesting quotes that Heather gave me of the many I'll share, it was kind of, kind of nailed her work as far as I understand. She said, trauma wounds don't heal on their own and need to be gently tended. Trauma is healed in the present moment, and cycling can teach present moment awareness that leads to the ability to pay attention to what's happening in the mind, body, heart, and the environment around you. I thought that was really cool and kind of really summed up not only her mission, but a lot of the things that she, a lot of the stories that she shared from working with clients. Yeah, I have to imagine a lot of that is just based on the feeling that mountain biking improves your self worth. Like you can go out and accomplish a uh, new trail or a new feature or something like that. And I mean, speaking with like somebody who has survived a sexual assault or sexual trauma, is probably dealing with a lot of self-worth issues. And so to go out there and uh, yeah, rebuild that with other people who have sort of dealt with the same thing. I mean, I feel like that's gotta be huge in the same way that, you know, combat veterans who are maybe missing a limb and, kind of feel their self-worth is taking a hit and uh, find that to be very debilitating to be able to go out there and sort of accomplish things again. Yeah. I imagine that's going to be huge. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a pretty powerful tool. This, this sport we love so much. It's really cool to to hear about all these different ways that it's being used and um, all these different programs that have come up to support 
folks that are dealing with various issues and using mountain biking to do that. When we close out, I, I, I want to make sure that we don't just hear this as mountain bikers and use it as like a pat on the back to say like, oh, I'm mountain biking, so I'm okay. And, you know, this is for me and it really helps me. You know, this is also about like thinking about people around you who could maybe benefit from mountain biking or even people you know who are dealing with stuff and are mountain bikers. You know, this is should be like a call to invite them along with you. Um, and to, to really use that, the social power of mountain biking to heal folks, but also again, just the sport itself, you know, can really be helpful for people. So yeah, if you can take a moment and think about somebody who could benefit from this and introduce them to mountain bike and tell them about how it's helped you. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe it can help them too. Also talk about it with your friends, you know, the people you already ride with and, give them be vulnerable too. you know, I think sometimes we don't do that maybe, uh, especially as guys and just let people know like, Hey, you know, mountain biking's really important to me or like this friendship is really important to me. And like, I, I really need this in my life. And you'll be surprised like how many other people are like in a similar situation and, and how they can support you and you can support them. Yeah. I think that there's a social feedback loop. Like I mentioned earlier, making the social connections is really strong, but it goes for receiving and giving. So, uh, I mean, I think we all know like giving a compliment or donating or something like that is the huge boost to your own mental health as well as, you know, it's nice to receive a compliment, but I think there's a lot of research that shows it's probably more healthy to give a compliment, um, and to be the first one to reach out. So text your friends, get them on the next ride. Yeah, for sure. And, and be nice to the people who are out on the trail. You know, a lot of times we go out there and, and yeah, we may be in a bad mood or whatever, and we're out there to kind of get a release, but other people are trying to do the same thing. And so, yeah, if we can all just kind of see where, where each other is at and like meet each other halfway. And I think everybody will benefit a lot from that. So if you're interested in this topic, uh, there's certainly more information on single tracks. Uh, be sure to look up the groups that we mentioned here. We'll try to include a lot of them in the show notes. And also you can check out Jero's series of articles, Three Deep Breaths on single tracks. Uh, he's got a, a number of interesting topics around mountain biking and mental health uh, that you'll be sure to want to catch up on. That's all I've got this week. We'll talk to you again next week. Peace. <laughs>